Thank you. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, legal experts warned this Parliament that when teachers become named persons, they'll need to have lawyers on speed dial. With that in mind, does the First Minister have full confidence in the changes she is making to the named person legislation? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, as Ruth Davidson is aware, indeed, as the whole Parliament is aware, uh, the bill that is currently before Parliament to make amendments to the previous legislation in light of the Supreme Court uh, judgment is currently at stage one. Indeed, the comments that Ruth Davidson refers to, uh, I understand, were made in stage one evidence to the committee. Uh, this bill is designed uh, to address concerns that were raised by the Supreme Court. Uh, while allowing the principles of named person uh, to proceed. And, of course, it should be remembered that the Supreme Court found that the named person service was, and I quote, unquestionably benign and legitimate. So we will continue, of course, to uh, listen to all views that are expressed in Parliament as this bill uh, proceeds and uh, where a case is made for amendments at later stages uh, of the, the process that will be fully considered as Parliament would expect. Ruth Davidson. It's clear that some of the people who are going to have to implement this don't share the confidence of the First Minister. And we know, as she has rightly said, the government has had to change its plans because its first attempt was struck down by the Supreme Court. And the trouble is, we're now learning that there are significant problems with the proposed remedy, which is going to put professionals in an impossible position, pushing teachers and health workers into a legal minefield and having to weigh up the complex legal arguments about whether sharing information is proportionate or not. As the Faculty of Advocates made clear yesterday, they could end up damned if they do and damned if they don't. Does the First Minister really think it's fair to put already overburdened teachers and health workers in this position? First Minister. As, as every member is aware, in the stage one consideration of any bill, a range of different views will be expressed and government, as is our responsibility listens carefully to those views and, and considers uh, them as the bill proceeds through Parliament. That's the normal way uh, in which legislation uh, is taken forward. Uh, but I think it is important to say a number of things. Uh, this bill provides clarity and consistency by introducing a new requirement for named person service providers to consider whether sharing information could promote support or safeguard the well-being of the child or young person. And the bill also provides for, and this part is particularly important, uh, a binding code of practice which will ensure that appropriate safeguards are in place to protect the sharing of information. Um, and of course, uh, Parliament will be fully consulted on the code of practice as it is in terms of the legislation. Now, I appreciate uh, that Ruth Davidson is referring to comments that have been made in the stage one consideration. And as I say, uh, we listen carefully to all of those comments, but it's worth uh, I, I think uh, looking at some of the comments that were made uh, earlier on when the Education Committee made a call for evidence. The GMC Scotland, for example, we warmly welcome uh, the proposed move away from a mandatory duty to share information at Royal College of General Practitioners. We welcome the amended wording uh, of the bill, the Nursing and Midwifery Council. We can currently see no conflict between the draft legislation proposed and our own regulatory uh, approaches. Uh, the Law Society of Scotland, the move from a duty to share to a power to share uh, information uh, is uh, helpful. Uh, and you know, these are just some of the comments that were made. So we can all quote backwards and forwards uh, comments about the bill. We have an established legislative process in this parliament uh, whereby we listen, uh, and this is the role of the committee at stage one, uh, listens to these comments. Uh, the committee will then uh, publish a stage one report. The government will fully consider that and we will consider whether any amendments are justified at a later stage of the bill. Uh, that is the normal process. It is the one that will be followed here. And I would encourage all members to fully take part in it. Ruth Davison. Well, I hear the First Minister's points, and in fact, I have the submissions to the committee uh, here. But the problem is that even those in favour of the scheme are warning about how it is going to be done. So if you take the Royal College of Nursing, which supports, in principle, the scheme, it is made clear that it doesn't support it going ahead without the right resources in place. And they worry that the whole plan could be reduced to, and I quote, a tick box exercise. So we have a scheme that has already been barred by the Supreme Court last year and now a replacement plan, which even supporters think is deeply flawed. So again, I have to ask, does the First Minister think it looks like a success? First Minister. Well, firstly, if I can just correct uh, Ruth Davidson and what she said about the Supreme Court judgment. The Supreme Court 
uh, judgment was specifically about the information sharing provisions. It did not say that the whole scheme was illegal. In fact, I, I just quoted a moment ago uh, the comments of the Supreme Court in terms of the named person scheme uh, overall. Uh, for, secondly, Ruth Davidson uh, mentioned resources, obviously extremely important. An additional £1.2 million is being provided uh, to support training and development relating to the changes to information sharing, just as uh, one example of uh, the resource issue. But I come back to my, my central point, and I, and I suppose I want to make this point to any stakeholders who might be listening, as well as to, to Ruth Davison and to the Chamber. The reason we have this process, uh, this legislative process, which involves this in-depth stage one consideration by a committee, is to allow stakeholders to put forward the points of view and to argue for any changes they think are necessary. And at the end of that part of the process, the government will give that due consideration. That's the, the proper process. Uh, and every member in this chamber, every member has now been uh, a member through the legislative process uh, on uh, at least one or more bills. Uh, the changes are regularly made uh, to, to bills. And that is the process we require to go through. So I would encourage everybody, as many members will already be doing, to continue to contribute to that. Uh, and at the end of that, uh, we intend that we will have rectified the issues uh, highlighted by the Supreme Court, but also have in place a system that has as its central purpose, and let's none of us ever lose sight of that, the greater protection of vulnerable children, which is one of the most important responsibilities, surely, of all of us. Ruth Davidson. I'm not sure how reassured stakeholders will be by that answer because, presiding officer, it's been clear to these benches for years that the name person scheme as designed simply won't work. But we have a Scottish government that is still ploughing ahead with it. And after five years of debating this back and forward, here is where we are at. A second attempt at legislation that even its supporters say is flawed that legal experts say is confused and that teachers and health workers warn will be an enormous burden on them. So I ask her, you know, in all sort of good faith, can we not just start again with a blank sheet of paper because all of us in this chamber, all of us in this chamber want to protect vulnerable children, but we need to do it within the law. First Minister. I'm glad that eventually, after uh, all of her questions, Ruth Davidson uh, managed to mention vulnerable children, because actually they are at the centre of this. Now, look, I think what we, what we have here, and let me, let me try to, to deal with this uh, very respectfully, we have a, a difference of opinion and principle between these benches and the Conservatives. The Conservatives disagree with the name person scheme in principle, and I uh, don't go along with that, but I respect the right to do so. But the Supreme Court did not uphold the view of the, the Scottish Conservatives that the name person scheme in principle was illegal. What it did was point to what it saw as problems and flaws with the information sharing provisions. And this bill is about rectifying those flaws. Now, we're at the start of a legislative process uh, and stakeholders make their views known and we consider their views. So that's the process we should engage in. Of course, we can continue uh, to debate the rights and wrongs of the scheme. Uh, but Ruth Davidson shouldn't uh, try to give the impression that the Supreme Court somehow uh, said that the whole scheme was illegal because it did not uh, do that. And I think she knows that. So we will continue to proceed here to make sure that all of the provisions are, as Ruth Davidson says, clearly within the law. As we do that, we will consider, to all, consider all views that are raised, but we will also continue to go forward with that central purpose firmly in mind. This is about the greater protection of vulnerable children, and that is the most important part of this whole debate. Question to Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, there are 40,000 children in Scotland today more in poverty than there was a year ago. The Scottish Government is introducing legislation to set targets to reduce child poverty, but what actions is it going to take? In other words, what is the First Minister proposing to do to tackle the unacceptable levels of child poverty in Scotland? First Minister. Well, Ali Rowley Fares fairly asked me about actions that we are taking. Uh, so let me uh, set out what some of those are. Uh, firstly, uh, we have the Child Poverty Bill, which, if it is uh, passed by this Parliament, will make 
as the only administration in the whole of the UK to have statutorily binding targets on child poverty. We have just also established the Poverty and Inequality Commission, uh, which will build on the work done by the Independent Poverty Advisor to make sure that the government is both advised and challenged on the actions we need to take to tackle uh, child poverty. We've also outlined uh, steps to introduce a new Best Start grant uh, using one of the new powers of the Parliament to direct additional support to families uh, on low incomes with children uh, to try to uh, give practical help uh, in that regard. Uh, just this week we were uh, announcing, for example, additional support for young carers, which can often be uh, a particular segment of the, the population of children living in poverty. So these are just some examples. Uh, in addition, of course, to extending uh, entitlement to free school meals, uh, our plans to double the provision of uh, free childcare, which will be of huge assistance uh, to families overall, but particularly to families in poverty. So these are just some of the things that we're doing uh, and we can continue to discuss through the Commission and indeed with members across the Chamber what additional action we can take. Alec Rowley. President Officer, I've welcomed the, the, the setting up of the Commission. This, hopefully that will be an independent statutory Commission. I've also welcomed the Bill coming forward. But the truth is, without additional resources, we can have all the targets we like. We're very unlikely to see them as being more than wishful thinking. The plain fact is, the First Minister plans to spend almost 20 times more on a tax cut for frequent flyers than she does on tackling child poverty. The, SN, the, SN, the SNP plan to half air departure tax would cost £180 million in each single year. But the First Minister's programme for government only proposes £10 million a year to tackle child poverty. That is simply not good enough. If you are serious, if you are serious about tackling the unacceptable levels of child poverty in our country, will you drop the tax cut to the airlines and use the taxpayers of this parliament to tackle child poverty in Scotland? First Minister. Hey, we will, of course, bring forward our budget proposals later uh, this year and Parliament will have the opportunity uh, to scrutinise them. Uh, as part of that, I have made it uh, very clear, the Finance Secretary made clear again in Parliament yesterday that we do think it is time for a, a grown-up adult debate about how we progressively and fairly use our tax powers uh, to guard against further Tory austerity and to make sure we're protecting public services and helping uh, lift people, including uh, children, out of poverty. But I, I do think, and, and I say this uh, in all seriousness, I, I think Alec Rowley's characterisation of our spending plans is actually a misrepresentation. Uh, I announced in the programme for government that we would set up an additional fund uh, to target innovative approaches to tackling child poverty. But what Alec Rowley didn't, uh, of course, mention there was the hundreds of millions of pounds uh, we spend on mitigating welfare cuts, for example, on extending childcare, on making sure that the poorest children have access to free school meals, uh, the money that we will make available for the new Best Start grant, for example, the £3 billion uh, that we're investing in increasing the supply of affordable housing, something hugely important to those living in poverty. Uh, so these are uh, the many actions we are taking, backed by resources, and the role of the Poverty and Inequality Commission, of course, will be uh, to make suggestions and to challenge us where we can to go further, and we look forward to taking taking part in those debates in Parliament and outside of this Parliament. Alec Rowley. <laughs> President, officer, it is, it is a serious issue. It's an unacceptable issue, the levels of child poverty in Scotland. And I do say, in all sincerity, if, to the First Minister, if every child in Scotland is to get a fair and equal chance to succeed, then you're going to have to address the crisis that is engulfing so many of our public services in Scotland. For it is the poorest that are coming off the worst. The lack of suitable housing, the unacceptable levels of class sizes, and the lack of resources for teaching and for learning. The many shortfalls in our National Health Service, and the failure to fund 
local community services in every community up and down Scotland. Every single time the SNP has a tax decision to make, it sides with the millionaires rather than with the millions. Another, another. Order, order, please. Order, please. Order, please. Thank you, Alec Rowley. Another party, presiding officer, for the few, not the many. Will she? Will she? Will she? Will the First Minister, will the First Minister finally accept that in order to help the poorest in this country, you've got to be prepared to look at taxing the richest in this country? First Minister. President Officer, can I just say, I, I thought it was really unfair of Alec Rowley to personalise this debate by bringing Anna Sarwar into it. <laughs> so, thank you. The problem here, as Anna Sarwar so clearly illustrates, is that there is a massive gulf, a gulf as wide as the Clyde, between what Labour says and what Labour does. We have a Labour leadership candidate lecturing others about doing the right thing on pay and yet his own family firm won't pay the living wage voluntarily. So Labour, Labour should get its own house in order back. Alec Rowley mentioned a number of policy areas. Let me take them one by one. On housing, this government is building social housing at a faster rate than any other part of the UK. We're investing £3 billion to deliver 50,000 extra affordable homes. Uh, on education, £120 million extra going to the hand, into the hands of head teachers to help close the attainment gap. Free school uh, meals, extended childcare. On the NHS, an extra £3 billion going to the NHS uh, under this government. And on local services, uh, we put forward a budget last year that increased the resources available uh, to local services. And the only councils across this country who decided uh, not to take the opportunity of bringing in more revenue through the council tax were, guess what, Labour councils. So again, Labour really needs to close that gulf between what they say and what they lecture others and what they actually do themselves. Yeah. Okay, we'll try and refrain from personal attacks in this chamber. <laughs> I, I, I think it's only fair. Uh, we've got a number of constituency supplementaries, and we'll try and squeeze a lot of a lot of members want to get in today. Question number one from Alison Johnson. Um, thank you. One of Scotland's first major urban community buyouts for the Sick Kids Hospital site in Edinburgh has been gazumped because the NHS last week sold the site to a developer. Um, the community found out that they were unsuccessful, having notified ministers of their interest way back in April. Why has the NHS been allowed to sell off the site when ministers knew of the community interest? And if the Scottish Government is serious about community empowerment, urban community empowerment, what more will it do to actively support communities in their applications? They're hugely bureaucratic, very complicated, and more support is required. First Minister. Well, can I, can I firstly say I... I understand the strength of local feeling around issues like this, but it's important to stress that at all stages in this process, NHS Lothian uh, complied with the requirements of the law. At all stages in the community right to buy process, uh, the community land team processed the applications in line with the legislation. Uh, the uh, community land team and the Scottish Government were not aware the site had already been sold by NHS Lothian when processing uh, those applications. However, it's also important to say that NHS Lothian will use the proceeds from the sale of the Sick Kids Hospital to reinvest 
in health care services. Uh, and of course, that will be of benefit to people across uh, Lothian. As I understand it, the uh, Health Board is likely to use the proceeds to upgrade oncology services at the Western General Hospital, which uh, will benefit people not just in Lothian, but across the wider region. So I do understand the strength of feeling on these issues. Uh, I, uh, that is why we, we passed the legislation to support community right to buy. And it's important that all uh, applications are taken forward in line with the legal provisions. Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, there are 100 people um, complete with placards and a piper in the public gallery today who've come to the parliament to protest about proposals to cut their GP out of hours service at the Vale of Leven Hospital. The service has been closed many times, most recently on Sunday, when local patients were turned away and had to travel to Paisley for the nearest service. That is simply unacceptable, and local clinicians have said removing this basic service from the Vale represents an unacceptable clinical risk risk for patients. The chair of the health board said, and I quote, we need to stick to the agreed lines which confirm that we're committed to a service without saying what that will be or where it will be delivered from. Hardly a ringing endorsement. Will the first minister reject the weasel words from the chair and give an assurance to my constituents that the full GP out of hours service will remain at the Vale of Leven? Yes or no? First minister. Firstly, can I, can I take the opportunity to welcome uh, the campaigners to the public gallery? I'm not sure how the presiding officer will respond if they start to use the bagpipes uh, in the, uh, the gallery, but I'm sure they will do so outside. And the health secretary is actually going out to meet uh, with the campaigners uh, later on this afternoon. Um, I understand that there actually was uh, a meeting between uh, the chair and chief executive of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board with the Hospital Watch campaign on the 31st of August. Uh, the chair of Hospital Watch, Jim Moon, uh, said uh, after that meeting we discussed a number of issues and found the meeting to be constructive with a spirit and intention to acknowledge the community's fears with the aim that the model for the future secures their trust and confidence going forward. And that's how I would expect these discussions to be taken forward. I would say again, though, uh, that it is this government uh, that took the action that ended the decade of damaging uncertainty uh, under the previous Labour administration when it approved the vision for the Vale uh, document. Uh, we have been consistently clear that we back the Vale of Leven Hospital. The Health Board has been consistently clear on that. And just uh, as illustrations of that backing, let me just give a few statistics here. Uh, the Vale of Leven, day cases have increased by 7% in the last year. There are more than 300 outpatient clinics uh, every month across 20 uh, or more specialties. Emergency attendances have increased at the Vale's minor injuries uh, unit by nearly 10%. So these are the actions that show our commitment to the Vale. And of course, it was the previous administration. When Jackie Bailey uh, was a minister in the previous administration, of course, or she was a minister in the previous administration, and the previous administration closed the A&E at the Vale of Leven. Come on. There's no, no, no Ms there's no point of orders during First Minister's questions. If you still wish to make it, Ms Bailey, you can make it at the end. Ms Bailey may make the point of order at the end of FMQs. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm currently assisting a number of constituents in North Ayrshire who are on a lengthy waiting list for funding approval for social care packages and residential care placements due to budgetary constraints and pressures on the local health and social partnership. Uh, a lack of funding uh, is available and provision of care is extremely limited. Can the First Minister confirm whether or not free personal care is still a legal entitlement in Scotland and to her knowledge, which other councils are failing to deliver it? First Minister. Well, in terms of the situation in uh, North Ayrshire, uh, as I understand it, government officials have already met with the partnership there and um, the, the Health Secretary is, is going to meet with them as, as well and be very happy to correspond uh, with the member after that. It is the obligation of all uh, partnerships across the country to deliver uh, the social care services that people have a right to depend on. And I think it is worth just pointing out uh, the overall expenditure in adult social care services per head of population uh, has increased by 13 per cent uh, in real terms. That's after inflation. That uh, has been uh, the, the increase in recent years. So we will continue to uh, take the decisions to support social care services. Of course, we announced a couple of weeks ago that we're also going to introduce Frank's Law uh, in order that people who rely on these services across uh, the country get them and get them in a timely fashion. Thank you. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. When the Paris Climate Change Agreement was reached, the Scottish Government said that its new bill on climate change would reflect the increased scale of ambition that the agreement requires. Yet its proposals for that bill actually represent a slower pace of emission cuts than Scotland's been achieving for the last 10 years. Why is the government consulting on a slowdown of climate action when a, an acceleration and increased ambition is so urgently needed? First Minister. Well, I don't think there is uh, anybody, uh, well, that's undoubtedly not true. There will be many, but nobody who can fairly say uh, that this government has not been and is not continuing to be a world leader when it comes to tackling uh, climate change. Uh, some of my answer here, I suppose, will be similar to the answers I was giving Ruth Davidson. We are consulting um, and we listen to the views that are expressed in that consultation uh, before we make final decisions. And I know a large number of people have taken the opportunity uh, to contact the Scottish Government asking us to go further in terms of the commitments there and we will give proper consideration to that. Uh, but across a whole range of areas, uh, we are making progress in tackling climate change. The programme of government, uh, of course, uh, that I set out two weeks ago, uh, sets out where we will make further and even faster uh, progress, which is no doubt why uh, some environmental campaigners described that programme for government as the greenest programme for government in the history of devolution. Patrick Harvey. There has been significant action in the past, but that's only worth celebrating if it's used as a as an inspiration to go further and faster, not as an excuse to slow down. Other countries in Europe, such as Norway and Sweden, have already been setting net zero goals for carbon emissions. Our contribution to climate change will be significantly reduced if we do the same. Isn't it clear that Scotland, even if we continue to reduce emissions at the rate we've been doing for the last 10 years, will reach net zero by 2040. Isn't that the goal we should be setting ourselves if the First Minister is serious about making faster progress? Yeah. First Minister. Firstly, we are consulting on these specific targets. That's, that's the right and proper thing to do, and we will take final decisions uh, based on the, the outcome and the views that are expressed in that consultation. And um, I know many people, many environmental campaigners, many people who want to encourage us to go further faster have made their views known, and I very, very much welcome that. Let me, though, uh, reassure not just Patrick Harvey, but everybody, there is no intention, and I think anybody who listened to the programme for government or who has read the programme for government would see this, there is no intention on the part of this government uh, in slowing down when it comes to meeting our climate change obligations. We have a moral responsibility to lead in terms of tackling climate change and that's what we uh, will continue to do. So whether it's our commitments around uh, renewable energy, whether it's our uh, commitments and uh, our achievements in decarbonising electricity or whether it's about the new commitments we set out around electric vehicles, for example, uh, we are serious about this and we will continue to make sure that the action we take is genuinely world leading. Question number four, Willie Rennie. Thank you, President Officer. Yesterday, the mask of Ruth Davidson's Conservative Party slipped. They said taxing was pickpocketing, and that's straight from Norman Tebbett's handbook. Pickpockets don't invest in schools and hospitals to educate children and save people's lives. Responsible governments do. That is why this Parliament rejected that right-wing agenda yesterday. Now that the Parliament has endorsed the principle of raising tax, will the First Minister reconsider her opposition to my plan to put a modest penny on income tax for education. First Minister. Well, I have to say, I, I think to be absolutely fair and accurate about it, Ruth Davidson's mask slipped long before uh, <laughs> yesterday. Uh, yesterday just put it uh, beyond any doubt. And Willie Rennie raises an important point. It's one I've raised uh, previously myself in the chamber. Each and every day, we hear from the Conservatives uh, calls for additional spending. We heard uh, calls for Frank's Law, which the government is now uh, delighted to be taking forward. But we get from the Tories calls for more spending uh, while they want us to cut taxes for the richest yeah. in our society. Yeah. And remember, all at the same time as the Tory government is cutting over this decade Scotland's budget to the tune of three billion pounds in real terms. So the hypocrisy of the Tories on these issues uh, knows no bounds. Uh, on the substantive issue that Willie Rennie raises, and I'm glad that he has raised it, we will bring forward, as, as governments do, our tax proposals when we uh, publish our draft budget. And what we have said we will do is uh, encourage 
uh, an open, grown-up, which clearly excludes some people in this uh, chamber, <laughs> uh, debate uh, on how we properly, progressively and fairly use our tax powers. I've been, I think, fairly clear that I do think, given the years of austerity we've had and the continued austerity we face, as well as the economic implications of Brexit, it is time now to have that debate. Uh, I hope, and certainly from the tenor of his contribution yesterday in the Chamber, I think Willie Rennie and his party uh, will be part of that grown-up debate. And let's have that debate over the next few weeks, and then let's come forward, uh, come forward as the government will, with proposals on tax uh, that Parliament then can then scrutinise and decide on. That's the right way to do things. Willie Rennie. Well, the First Minister says that education is her number one priority, but we've heard that thousands may be leaving teaching. We know that Scottish education has slipped down the international rankings. We've seen 150,000 places cut from colleges. We are committed to expand nursery education. We know investing in skills and education is important for economic growth. And the First Minister is always complaining that Westminster has cut our budget. So the case for investment in education, I think, is tremendously strong. So if she can't agree that education is the number one priority for investment, what will her priority be? First Minister. I think Willie Rennie should perhaps listen to, to what I'm saying here. Firstly, we have to have a debate as a, a parliament uh, about whether we want to use tax powers more extensively than we have uh, in the past. And then, of course, we have a debate uh, as parliament about how we want to invest uh, those resources. Uh, but there's no doubt uh, that it is about protecting public services, education, and the health service, making sure our public sector workers are properly and fairly rewarded against the backdrop of austerity uh, that leads us to have uh, that debate. On education, I mean, obviously, I uh, would take issue with much of uh, what Willie Rennie said in his preamble there. We are not just extending, we are doubling uh, childcare uh, for our youngest children. We're investing £120 million more this year in our schools. We have maintained full-time equivalent places in our colleges, and of course, we're protecting uh, the right of young people to go to university without paying tuition fees. Uh, so these are the things that underline the commitment of this government to education. But over these next few weeks, let's try and do something as a parliament. Let's have that proper grown-up debate. We all have our manifesto commitments. Uh, but as I am uh, frequently told by Willie Rennie uh, and, and others, this government needs the support of others to get a budget through Parliament. So what I'm saying is I go into these discussions with an open mind and with the interest of our public services, our public sector uh, workers, with businesses and the economy firmly at heart. Let's have that debate and let's come to a decision, <coughs> a grown-up decision as a Parliament. Thank you. We have a couple more supplementaries. Ivan McKee. Uh, the First Minister will have seen the shocking scenes in Catalonia. Armed police have raided offices and seized ballot papers in an attempt to stop the Catalan people voting on their own future. Can I ask, what is the Scottish Government's view of these appalling events? First Minister. Well, I, I think uh, most people would agree that uh, the situation in Catalonia is of concern. Um, I hope that there will be dialogue between the Catalan and the Spanish governments to try to resolve this situation. That has got to be preferable to the sight of police officers seizing ballot papers and entering newspaper uh, offices. It is, of course, entirely legitimate for Spain to oppose uh, independence for Catalonia. Uh, but what I think is of concern anywhere is for a state to seek to deny the right of a people to democratically express their will. Uh, the right of self-determination is an important international principle and I hope very much that it will be respected in Catalonia and everywhere else. Uh, finally, presiding officer, of course, the Edinburgh Agreement is a shining example of two governments with diametrically opposed views on independence, nevertheless coming together to agree a process that allowed the people to decide. And I think that offers a template that could be used by others elsewhere in the world. And Rhoda Grant. The press report that the UK government have stripped the Scottish government of responsibility for the rollout of broadband due to their failure to deliver. Can I ask the First Minister what implications does this have for the rollout of the R100 programme? 
First Minister. Well, it has no implications because it is completely and utterly nonsense uh, to suggest <laughs> that that is, is the case. Uh, we are making good progress through the Superfast Broadband programme just now, uh, which of course is about getting Superfast Broadband to 95% uh, of premises across Scotland. And our additional commitment, and let's be very clear about this, our additional commitment goes way beyond the commitment of the UK government. Our uh, additional commitment is to get super fast broadband, not 10 uh, megabits per second as the UK government is proposing, but super fast broadband to 100% of premises across the country. Now, if the UK government was a bit clearer about how they intend to deliver their commitment, that would certainly be helpful to us uh, in progressing to deliver ours. But that commitment is there, and that is a commitment that we are absolutely determined to deliver, and we're making good progress towards it. Later uh, on this year, we are due uh, to go out to procurement for the next stage of that work. Question number five, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the reported comments of the Secretary of State for Scotland that the UK government does not plan to devolve, any, devolve all powers returning from the EU following Brexit. First Minister. Well, David Mundell's comments confirm what uh, not just the Scottish government, but the Welsh government as well has been saying for months. Uh, far from a powers bonanza, the Secretary of State has uh, promised the UK government seems intent on undermining the founding principles of devolution. Uh, the UK government should not be allowed to use Brexit as cover to take powers in areas that are clearly devolved, such as agriculture, fisheries, justice and the environment. Uh, we have made it clear that we are not opposed in principle uh, to UK-wide arrangements where they are necessary and appropriate, but these arrangements must be by agreement and not by imposition. Bruce Crawford. Thank the First Minister for her answer. Would the First Minister agree with the comments from stakeholders such as Friends of the Earth Scotland who have said that any plan to move control to Westminster after Brexit is alarming? And can she outline what clarification the UK government has provided over the 111 devolved policy areas that would, could be controlled by the UK government if the EU withdrawal bill is not amended? I can say, First Minister, I was some go gobsmacked to see at number 78 on the list onshore hydrocarbons licensing, in other words, fracking, which was one of the core powers for further devolution as recommended by the Smith Commission. Is this really acceptable? First Minister. Uh, no, it's not acceptable. Firstly, in terms of Friends of the Earth, I, I share uh, their concern. Uh, devolution has allowed for distinctive and ambitious Scottish approaches to environmental standards, to climate change, which we've just been discussing, to food quality, fisheries, farming support, and many other areas. And any threat to that is completely unacceptable. Uh, the list of 111 areas uh, that are brought into play uh, by the Withdrawal Bill, of course, was a list drawn up not by the Scottish Government, but by uh, the UK uh, Government. And uh, there are many areas in that that I think would illustrate to people why the Scottish Government is so exercised uh, by this. But while it might suit the Conservatives to suggest that this is somehow just the SNP expressing concern over this, uh, we have the Welsh Labour government saying exactly the same. We have a, a range of constitutional and legal experts saying that this uh, does represent the power grab that we have described. So the Scottish and Welsh government said on Tuesday of this week, we put forward a set of amendments uh, that would prevent this power grab. Uh, I hope the UK government responds positively to these amendments so that we can get this bill into a state uh, where the government can recommend legislative consent. But let me repeat, if it stays in the state it's in just now, there is no way I or this government will recommend to this parliament that it approves this bill. Question number six, Annie Wells. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the first minister what the Scottish government's response is to reports that the electrification of the Glasgow to Edinburgh via Falkirk rail service is subject to further delay. First Minister. Uh, well, this delay is uh, regrettable. It's a result of two issues. The first is that Network Rail is behind schedule on the energisation of the route. Uh, that commenced on the 2nd of September and is scheduled to conclude in October, and that will allow the introduction of electric trains uh, using existing rolling stock from December uh, 2017, December this year. Uh, the second issue, of course, is a slippage in the manufacturing programme of the rolling stock by Hitachi. Uh, the Transport Minister has written to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee updating them on these issues. Uh, I'm also due to meet with Hitachi on the 4th of October uh, to discuss this matter further. Annie Wells. Thank you for, the, for that answer. This project is at least a year delayed and we still don't have a final completion date. 
Last year, Phil Vester of ScotRail admitted management failure in the planning of the delivery of the new line. We are told the new delays because ScotRail couldn't test the new trains. Commuter patience is wearing thin. So can the First Minister give a personal guarantee that there will be no further delays after December? First Minister. Of course, Network and Rail is not uh, accountable directly uh, to this Parliament. That, frankly, is one of the, the problems. And perhaps we could find some consensus across this Parliament that would say we should make the change to make Network Rail directly accountable to this government and this Parliament in the future. But if we can uh, focus on the issues uh, affecting passengers, because I, uh, as I think you can probably tell, I'm, I'm deeply unhappy uh, about this further uh, delay. I've, I've talked about the issues with Network Rail's delay around the energisation of the line. And it's, as I'm sure everybody uh, would agree, it's vital that these train, the line uh, is dealt with properly and the trains are properly tested. But a large part of uh, the latest delay is down to the slippage in the manufacturing programme uh, on the part of Hitachi. I want to discuss this fully uh, with Hitachi when I meet them earlier uh, next month, and I'd be happy uh, to report back to Parliament uh, after that meeting. Uh, but we uh, will do everything in our power as the Scottish Government to make sure that there are no further delays and that passengers get the full benefits of this improved service as quickly as possible. Linda Fabiani. The First Minister may be aware that another effect of this delay is that due to the shortage of, of diesel carriages, uh, other lines that are not, for example, uh, Edinburgh to Glasgow get affected, like in East Kilbride, where consistently there are too few carriages, uh, people are overcrowded on a main commuter line, and uh, I am told that once electrification of Glasgow Edinburgh rail line is complete, that problem will be solved. So would the First Minister please bear in mind in any discussions about the effect this has on other commuter rail lines and make sure that these concerns are always brought to the attention of those that make the decision in relation to number of carriages on lines? First Minister. Linda Fabiani is absolutely right and she's absolutely correct in her understanding and I can assure her that the impact on other lines uh, will be a feature in all of the discussions that we have on uh, this issue. Uh, the provision of additional coaches on other services, East Kilbride uh, included, depends on the introduction of new rolling stock elsewhere uh, within the, the ScotRail business. ScotRail are working to understand and manage the impact of phased introduction of the new electric trains on the Edinburgh to Glasgow route in the coming months. I think it is important, though, final uh, point, presiding officer, to stress that £475 million pounds is being invested in the Scott Rail fleet during this franchise, delivering 180 more carriages in the next two years, uh, which is a 50% increase since 2007. Question number seven, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what financial support the Scottish Government offers to parents of premature babies whose child is in hospital. First Minister. Firstly, uh, President Officer, I expect I, I speak for the whole chamber when I say uh, I'm delighted that Mark Griffin and his wife have now been able to take their baby daughter home from hospital and I'm sure we all wish uh, him, his wife and little baby the very best. <laughs> Health boards offer a range of support for parents who need additional support while their babies are in care, uh, but the support that is available does vary from board to board. Uh, following a review of maternity and neonatal services, we're working with the neonatal managed clinical networks to take forward a review of the support that is available to ensure consistent support is in place. And I can assure uh, Mark Griffin that we will fully consider uh, his proposal for a low income family fund as part of that work. Mark Griffin. I thank the First Minister for that answer and the support that I've had, my wife and I have had from across the chamber. And in March, my wife and I were told that our unborn daughter would die due to very premature labor. Six months on, Baby Rosa, who wasn't given a chance, is now doing well at home. But that, those months spent with Rosa in hospital have been the most stressful time that we've ever gone through, and we're not alone in that. But other families don't have an MSP salary to cover the costs associated with that hospital stay, the transport, accommodation, food, and childcare that on average cost £200 a week. And mothers we spoke to already struggling to cope with the stress of having a very premature sick baby, having to leave that baby in hospital every night, were also worrying about how they were going to pay for the taxi to get to hospital the next day. And sometimes they just couldn't. Um, and those mothers had to be there because 
they had to be there to provide that life-saving breast milk that the premature babies needed because their, their stomachs just wouldn't tolerate formula. Now, First Minister, will you, as a matter of urgency, look at how we can give financial support to low-income parents of premature babies in hospital so that the costs of visiting doesn't stop one more mum from being with their baby? Thank you. First Minister. Um, I think the, uh, the short but perhaps more, most helpful answer to Mark Griffin's question there is yes, uh, we will uh, do that work and happy to, to work with him. I'm hugely uh, sympathetic to the, the case, the very powerful case that, that Mark Griffin has just set out. Uh, the review of maternity and neonatal services uh, that I mentioned uh, said, uh, recognised that point and it recommended a review be carried out of, and I'm quoting from it now, the approach to expenses for families of babies in neonatal care to develop a nationally agreed policy. And that's, that's I think, one of the key parts. Uh, there is a range of support that is available to families but it is not as consistent or necessarily as reliable as it needs to be. Uh, there needs to be a situation where it doesn't matter what part of the country a family is in, uh, if they are in the position that Mark Griffin has outlined, then there is the, the basic support uh, necessary to allow them to care for their child. So we will be taking forward this work. I think given uh, his personal experience, uh, uh, for obvious reasons, it would be very useful to have Mark Griffin's input into that, and I'll ask the Health Secretary to make contact with them to further that discussion. Thank you very much, and that concludes First Minister's questions, but a point of order from Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm afraid the First Minister isn't very good at history. She credits me with being a minister at the time of the cuts to the veil. That is simply not true. Can I advise the Presiding Officer, I actually wrote to Shona Robeson on the 29th of June about exactly this point. She has failed to reply. So I invite the First Minister to retract a statement that she knows is deliberately promoting a falsehood. And rather than using information as a smokescreen, the First Minister would better do respect, do respect to my constituents by answering the question about the future of out of hours at the Vale of Leven Hospital, which she patently failed to do. I thank Ms Bailey. Thank you for waiting till the end of FMQ's point of order. Uh, she has made a helpful clarification of her ministerial status or lack of it at the time, which I'm sure, I'm sure the government will reflect on. Thank you very much. We move on now to uh, members' business in the name of Stuart McMillan on National Eye Health Week. Yes. We'll just take a few moments to change these.